All right, let's go on to beans. Because beans are another superfood. And I love to talk about beans because beans are associated with long life and all, you know, all those blue zones, long lived populations. When we study elderly people all over the world, we find that the more beans they eat, the longer they live. Whoever eats the most beans lives the longest, just like green vegetables. They should be our major source of protein and our major source of carbohydrate because they're high in carbohydrate and protein, right? They're, they're carbohydrate rich and they're protein rich. They're a good, in other words, they have a lot of what we need to maintain our muscle mass, to maintain our strength, to maintain our energy. They're digested very slowly, so when you eat them, they last you for many hours and they prevent overeating because they're very filling. Now, beans have a compound called um, inositol penticus phosphate, IP5, which is very powerful against cancer. It doesn't allow cancer cells to replicate. And they're also full of phytic acid and, you know, these phytates that have anti-powerful anti-cancer effects too. A lot of factors, and they're full of polyphenols and flavonoids as a whole. So beans have a, you know, the colorful beans, especially the red beans and the black beans, white beans, they have all these colors that are full of different phenols that give them that colorful, you know, the colorful you that make them so healthy. You know, you guys know that when you eat blueberries, those beneficial compounds that make the blueberries blue are so healthy for us in our brain. And when you eat blueberries, you don't urinate out the blue, do you? No, it doesn't turn your urine blue. You keep the color inside you. Those, when you eat a red bean, you don't urinate red or you don't, eat green vegetables, you don't urinate green, you keep a lot of those colors in you, and those polyphenols and stay, in your color, stay in your skin and color your skin. And they, and, those, and they protect you against skin cancer. But they don't just attract, they're not just attracted to the skin, they permeate every organ of your body, including your brain, and your liver, and your kidney, and your heart. These phytonutrients stay into your tissues. They live in your tissues. And they're active and they stay there for, you know, for years and months. And, you know, they're important to be replenished and they're important to be high in our tissues. You can look at a person. I can look at a person and see how healthy they've been eating just by looking at the color of their skin. You notice how a lot of people you, um, will go to their doctor and the doctor will say, something wrong with you, your skin looks orange. And they'll put their hand out next to you and go, look at my fleshy pink color, you must, something, you know, my, your orange tinge, is something wrong with you? I have too much carotinemia in your skin, you're eating too much carrot juice? No, I don't eat carrot juice, I'm just, it's all the vegetables I eat, whatever. But the point is, you should say to your doctor who tells you that, that it's you who has the abnormal color to your skin. This is the way your skin should look. So this means I'm protected, and you, however, but you are not protected, and you're going to be at high risk of early death, especially from cancer, from not having that color in your skin, because that shows you're not eating enough vegetables. Did you follow that? Just like you go to your doctor, not to diverge too much, but you go to your doctor and he tells you, your white blood cell count is too low. It's only 3.6, and it should be between 5 and 10. Maybe you have to go to the hematologist for them, one of those or an oncologist for those bone marrow biopsies, which is going to kill you, to check you don't have cancer because your low white blood cell counts. The facts are is that when you eat a healthy diet, like I recommend, it drops your white blood cell count low out of the normal range because low white blood cell counts are linked to people who live longer life and have lower cancer rates because when you're eating all the food, the immuno, this food that supports your immune system and, doesn't, and takes away inflammation, you don't need all those white blood cells floating around. There's not so much inflammation in your body. And you should say to your doctor, who doesn't know it better, it's not his fault, he never learned this stuff. He's trying his best. But you should say to your doctor, no, um, you know, Dr. Smith, it's you with the higher white blood cell count who's at risk of getting cancer. Myself with a lower white blood cell count, as Dr. Furman said, is, is the one protected against cancer. You're the one who needs the bone marrow biopsy. <laughs> So don't be confused about that. A low white blood cell count is a good sign, not a bad sign. You shouldn't be in the normal range where other Americans lie. You know, that's a sickly population. But in any case, inositol penticus phosphate, you know that's powerful stuff because it's 26 letters long. It has to be. <laughs> and, of course, people who eat beans even just twice a week. There's a study on men who eat beans twice a week drop their risk of colon cancer by half. Imagine if they eat beans every single day, right? You know what happens, no more friends left, <laughs> but they don't get cancer. But as you eat beans regularly, of course, your body builds up the bacteria it takes to digest them. And the gas problem goes away if you eat them regularly. Unfortunately, the gas problem goes away, but there's other fun things about beans. Now, see, if you eat, the studies show that if you eat beans, even two tablespoons a day, if you're giving them too much indigestion, start with smaller amounts, increase them over, gradually over months. So you can digest, you can build up the bacteria and the 
bacteria, and the digestive capacity to digest them better, right? But just two tablespoons a day decreases death rate by 8%. Imagine if you ate a cup and a half or two cups a day, you'd live forever. So let's, so, but let's look at this for a minute, because beans are the highest in fiber almost all foods. They're the highest in slowly digestible starches. That means we're looking at carbohydrates and ranking carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of ones that are lower glycemic to higher glycemic. We know that the slowly digestible fibers in beans, the slow digestible starches, excuse me, break down the glucose very, very slowly and feed carbohydrate into your body over many hours, fueling you for energy, allowing your body to burn it for energy as opposed to storing it, because it doesn't raise an insulin response and it keeps the glucagon at it working, so you can still burn fat at the same time you're burning the carbohydrate from bean, so you're gonna lose, maximally lose your weight, keep your glucose levels favorable, help reverse your diabetes, and they're full of something called resistant starch, which is almost like a fiber, because it's starch that is not digestible by the, by, we don't have the enzymes to digest it. So what happens to that resistant starch in the bean? It's degraded by bacteria. And after a while, we, and the more we eat beans regularly, the more we build up the bacteria to digest the resistant starch, and we convert that resistant starch into a fat, short, short chain fat, predominantly short chain fatty acids, predominantly the one that's called butyrate, and that butyrate, some of it gets absorbed, which has anti-diabetic effects and immune protective effects as well, and the butyrate and those fatty acids have an anti-inflammatory effect on the wall of the colon, preventing inflammation and reducing risk of getting hemorrhoids or constipation. But the point is, is that, you know, that's the, that's the disease called um, diverticulum or diverticulosis. Those little pockets from eating a low fiber, high meat diet. And I've seen in my 25 years of medical practice, scoping people, putting scopes in people's rectums and looking up their um, colon to see what's in there, you know, and, and seeing that a lot of them have diverticulum, but, after, but they come back five years later or 10 years later after following the program and eating better, and the diverticulum are gone, disappeared. I learned that, I learned something by, able to, by scoping these people, that it actually, I was able to watch these diseased colons getting better because they were changing their diet, really exciting. But the resistant starch is something that's beneficial, and, it, and because it's converted into the fat, the carbohydrates convert into fat, and it occurs so far down in the digestive process, 90% of those calories don't get absorbed into the body. Only 10% get absorbed. 90% of those calories go into the stool, increasing the fat in the toilet bowl. So part of the calories in beans are lost to the toilet bowl, and of course, lowering the glycemic effect of the beans even further, and the fact that the bacteria that the beans enable to grow, that they feel they're a prebiotic, Beans fuel the growth of an, and accelerate the growth of the healthy bacteria in, in your digestive tract, and those bacteria have beneficial effects, which slow the absorption of glucose from other foods that are not beans. So had I ate beans with a mango in the same meal, the glucose from the mango would be absorbed more slowly because I had beans in that meal. Did you follow that? Yep. Now, scientists call it the second meal effect because you have these bacteria that live in your digestive tract now all the time, and what you eat at the next meal is gonna be slowed. The, glu the glycemic load of that following meal after you ate the beans is gonna be slowed because you eat beans regularly because of the bacteria that are now present in your, in your digestive tract all the time. But it's not just the second meal effect. The second meal effect is not a good name for it, even though that's what the scientists call it, because it's the third meal, fourth meal, or fifth meal. It doesn't matter when you eat the meals, right after or, or the next day or six meals later, you're still getting the benefit from those bean-based bean, ba bean bacteria growth. Did you follow that? So beans, if we look at the nutritional density of carbohydrate, if we look at the fiber, if we look at the resistant starch, if we look at the glycemic load, then we can rate carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of quality, and then we see that the, the ones adding the starch and fiber gives us a good idea that these beans are the most beneficial when you have metabolic hindrance to weight loss, such as you know, obesity and diabetes, and you're a person genetically who's a difficult weight loser, then you want to especially eat less of the, those carbohydrate foods with a higher glycemic load and low fiber, and eat more that are high in fiber, high in nutrients, more resistant starch, and, you know, and, and lower glycemic, okay? So they're a superfood with powerful anti-cancer effects, and, they, and, they, and they're also relatively inexpensive, and make it easy for people to, you know, we should be giving away beans. Right? Really. 
well, you can't really eat beans raw. You have to soak them and cook them, unless you sprouted them. Yeah. But basically, they should be... But so I'm an advocate of using cooked beans in your diet. Okay? And onions are another superfood. You know, onions have been... You know, I didn't really used to like onions or know they were a superfood years ago. I didn't eat that many onions. But now I learned about their power to prevent cancer, and I put them in, I put them in all my food, all it's like raw, I add them here, I add them there. Like, for example, I'll make a cooked kale dish, I'll steam the kale, and I'll, for just 10 minutes, I'll use the timer, only steam it for 10 minutes. And I'll take it out with the tongs and put it in like a dish towel and fold the towel over to get a little water out. And then I'll take the towel away into the chopping bowl and I'll chop the kale, maybe with a cashew cream sauce I made with unsweetened soy milk and a little raw cashews and some toasted sesame seeds. Or I'll, you know, I'll put a little nutritional yeast or maybe a little roasted garlic in there. So I'll make a little cream sauce for the kale, chop it in there. I'll drizzle a little tomato sauce on top of it. And then I'll sprinkle raw red onion all over it on top. Now, I, I, just, I like raw red onion on everything. I like the difference in flavors and the crunch from the raw red onion. I used to not even like that. But now that I know it's... But now I've been use, eating it more over these last 10 years or so, and now I really love raw onion. I like to put it on, on a lot of different foods. Because, because when it's raw, it has those beneficial compounds that, that um, benefit us. Now, I just ate that cooked kale just now, right? right? So did I not produce the isothiocyanides from the cooked kale because... I cooked it and, and weakened or inactivated the myrosinase compound. What do you think? They get any benefit? What are the, they get the full benefit from the kale? Yes? Why? How come? Yes. You're just guessing. <laughs> What's that? What I tell us? Yeah, okay. I particularly paid attention to eat some raw watercress, arugula, or or some raw cruciferous vegetable on my salad at that meal, so I'd have my rosinase enzyme present in the digestive tract when I was eating the cooked kale. So I got more benefit from the kale. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, now, lately, you know, because of this new idea, these new um, studies in science on, on the heat sensitivity of these important enzymes, I make it, when I go to a salad bar, I, make it a, I pay particular attention to adding a little arugula to my salad or adding some red cabbage to the salad or adding a little baby kale to the salad. Or adding, and I love the, like, the baby arugula and the baby kale. And I grow in my garden. You know, I'll, grow, I'll, plant, um, you know, I'll plant like baby cabbage or kale or you know, other types of... Um, like every two weeks, I'll start a new, new row. And I'll eat from that row and, I'll then two, and then the next row will come up and eat from that row. You know, so I'm, I'm, making, I'm paying particular attention to make my salads to include not just lettuce, but also the raw cruciferous and to chew them really well. So I eat that with the meal. I'm eating my cooked Brussels sprouts or my cooked kale or my cooked broccoli with, so there's some myrosinase enzyme there to activate the conversion. Now you're following that? Mustard greens, mustard seed, whatever you want to use, but you should be aware of this so you're, doing, so you're maximally getting more nutritional bang for, your, for what you're eating. Does it matter how it's cooked? If I do like roasted kale chips, does that affect it? Well, of course, the less you cook it, the better it's going to be, and the more you cook it, the worse it's going to be. So if you want going to dry out kale chips, then you want to make it as, you want to do as low temperature as possible and might nicely dehydrate them. Don't really use a dehydrator. If you're using your oven, put it on the lowest setting possible because the less you cook something, the more you're going to retain that, the enzymatic action. The more you cook it, especially roasting it and darkening it and blackening it, you don't want to like, don't cook at high temperatures and as lower the better, right? Now, onions have been in, shown in scientific studies to, to be protective against almost all types of cancers, between 50 to 88% reduction in the highest consumer of onions, and those consumer of onions were only eating a half a cup of onions in the highest quartile of consumption. They weren't eating that much onion. And likewise to the myrosinase enzyme in kale, a myrosinase enzyme in all cruciferous vegetables, there's an enzyme called alienase in onion. Now, I know I spelled it wrong over and over again, but I got it spelled right on this slide. It has two L's and two I's. It's hard for me, it was hard for me to remember the two I's. And I used to, you know, so it's alienates. It has two I's in it. It's the only, one of the only words with two L's and two I's, right? So you can remember it now. Alienase. And you, and you want to remember to put raw onion on your salad. And if you need some cooked onion in the meal, then make sure you have some raw onion in the salad, too, to supply some of the alienase enzyme. But you know that onion is particularly protective. The, and now I'm going to have a salad bar, because I know this now. 
I go to the salad bar and I put some of those little scallion, crunchy little pieces of scallion on top of the salad. I know how anti-cancer powerful it is to eat that raw. And I put some red onion on the salad and I'll chop the red onion up finely. I'll take the red onion and I'll chop it up with very thin slivers and, and put it on my salad. And really, I love the flavor of it now, especially when it's distributed very thinly dispersed as opposed to big thick chunks. You know, I like that flavor and I developed a taste for it because I've been doing it. The more you eat something, the more you develop a taste to want to prefer to eat it that way. So it has that heat, sure, sure, there are lots of other protective factors in onion, but those substances in onion, like the quercetin and the fructooligosaccharides and that's present in the onion family, have powerful prebiotic effects. They're like a probiotic, right? You don't need to take the probiotics because your body will naturally produce those beneficial bacteria. You don't have to eat the sauerkraut and the yogurt and the fermented foods because when you eat the raw vegetables, like the raw cruciferous, the cooked beans, the cooked mushrooms and the raw onion, your body naturally makes the right balance and of the beneficial bacteria that benefit your health. Did you follow that? You don't need to take it, it's there. Your bacteria is natural fermentation and bacteria growth that takes place. And these are powerful foods against cancer. And what's more powerful than mushrooms? Mushrooms are not so high in micronutrients, they don't score high on my Andy score but they have other salient features that make them very important anti-cancer effects. And some of those most important features that make these mushrooms work how, you know, in conjunction with our immune system is one is the fact that they're powerful angiogenesis inhibitors, right? Powerful angiogenesis inhibitors. The word angiogenesis is not the first book of the Bible, no. It's, what it is is, the word angio means blood vessel and genesis means to make. And the angiogenesis inhibitor means it doesn't allow the body to grow new blood vessels. Because when you eat a high glycemic diet or you eat a lot of meats and you eat a lot of foods that are growth promoting because animal products promote growth hormone like IGF-1 and, and, and high glycemic carbohydrates promote insulin and they're both, gonna, they're both have promote angiogenesis. And they both promote the storage of fat. If you put you know, the animal products with the processed carbohydrates together, high insulin and IGF-1 simultaneously, that's how you're going to produce the most fat growth possible, by mixing it together. High carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate with high meat. So it's like the hamburger, the hot dog, the macaroni and cheese, the pizza. That's the most dangerous things you can do is eat the average American diet. Those are angiogenesis promoters and those, that means that allows, they promote fat growth and fat cells secrete angiogenesis promoters too. And the fat needs to have new blood vessels bring oxygen to it to keep it alive and more glucose and other nutrients to it to keep it growing. Without the new blood vessels, how does fat grow? It can't. You can't grow fat unless fat produces new blood vessels to fuel it. But mushrooms say, no way, Jose. I'm not letting you put fat on your body. When you eat mushrooms, it's difficult to store fat. When you eat mushrooms, it's difficult to have cancers grow and spread because for a cancer to replicate and grow, for a mass and a tumor to grow and replicate and to spread, it needs, it, part of the cancerous process is angiogenesis promotion that occurs from abnormal tissue and from cancerous cells that, are, that cancers get a whole huge blood vessel growth. Doctors recognize cancer by looking at blood vessel messaging. You know, where blood vessel is flowing increased in an area can make it light up to know it's got cancer there. So one of the hallmarks of cancer is that it's, a, it's tissue that's, has, that's angiogenesis promoting to allow, it's getting a blood supply and it's excessively growing. But mushrooms say, no way, Jose. I'm not letting you put, grow cancer. I'm not letting you, if you have cancer, I'm gonna retard its growth and, and interfere it from spreading. So mushrooms have powerful angiogenesis inhibiting compounds. And believe it or not, they have powerful aromatase inhibitors too in mushrooms, natural aromatase inhibitors. You've heard of the drug tamoxifen or those kind of medications they give women with breast cancer because these drugs block the aromatase enzyme that produces estrogen. So it keeps women's estrogen levels lower so it don't, they don't stimulate the cancer to grow. Well, you know what? Mushrooms do that all the time. Before, now, you don't wait till you have cancer. They have a special affinity to breast tissue to prevent breast tissue from being stimulated by estrogen, forcing or causing abnormal breast tissue growth. They allow normal growth and normal production of milk for the baby, and they allow normal growth of tissue during you know, development in teenage years, but they don't allow excessive growth of breast tissue. It's like magically designed. 
to allow normalcy but not abnormalcy. Did you follow that? And there are patients who have breast cancer who can't tolerate tamoxifen or, because they get depressed from it, but they can tolerate mushrooms and mushroom extracts, and mushrooms contain a mild carcinogen called a garotene. And a garotene is blown off with just a few minutes of cooking, steaming, water walking, cooking in a soup. So it's actually better to eat mushrooms cooked than raw. Some foods are better raw, and some foods are better cooked. Green vegetables are probably better raw, right? Onions, better raw. Tomatoes uh, and mushrooms, better cooked. We'll talk about that as we go along. And mushrooms have antigen binding lectins. That's a fancy sounding name, but they're, they kind of work in a weird way. They actually stick to or adhere to cells that are abnormal to help the natural killer T cells recognize cells for attack and removal before they become cancerous, right? Mushrooms are an extra, it's like a third arm to the immune system. You know how some animals have a tail for balance or have wings for flying? Well, we have an immune system that has an extra arm, makes it super protected, and that's, eating, that's using mushrooms. Super arm is the immune system for extra protection against disease. Berries, and I include pomegranate in that category, for the bee are also powerful superfoods with anti-cancer effects. And they're full of those dark, you know, they've been shown in scientific studies to actually lower blood pressure and lower cholesterol and actually protect the brain against aging. And like beans, because you think that berries are sugary, they're sweet, but they have a very low glycemic effect and they actually interfere the pectins, the polyphenols, the fibers they contain, they interfere with the absorption of glucose. They even interfere with the absorption of glucose that, of other foods that are not berries. They're diabetic favorable. They're cancer, anti-cancer favorable. And they protect the brain, of course, and have powerful anti-cancer effects, shocking some of the scientists that are doing the studies. I think some of these scientists studying blackberries and strawberries and wild blueberries were kind of shocked themselves when they saw some of these early stage cancers reversing and coming back to normal. One study gave people with um, squamous cell carcinoma of their esophagus, it gave them 60 grams of a strawberry extract a day and the majority of people had regression of cellular proliferation and apoptosis and, re and, and reversal of the cancers without even eating a healthy diet, just with the strawberry extracts. We're talking here about these are powerful anti-cancer compounds. And S for seeds, super powerful effective seeds. And how many of you eat some flax seeds or chia seeds or sesame seeds every day? Raise your hand. Flax, chia, or sesame every day. Wow, a lot of you do. I guess you're a very educated audience. <laughs> well, here's the thing. In most people, most audiences I lecture to, very few of the audience raises their hand. When I ask audiences, I lecture all over the country in medical conferences and, and you know, in medical and scientific meetings and, and um, in hospital meetings and things like that, and I mostly ask the crowd if they eat, eat mushrooms and very, and very few of them eat mushrooms regularly, and I ask them if they eat flax seeds or chia seeds or sesame seeds, and very few of them raise their hand they do that. And I say, well, how could you not do that? How come you don't know to do that? What if there was a a drug that could do what these foods could do. People would be paying $500 a month or $1,000 a month for it. And these are almost free and you're not doing it? Why don't you know about this? Why isn't it the front page of New York Times? Why doesn't, the, why doesn't everybody know about this? How could you not know about these important um, scientific advances in nutritional science? How could you not know about this stuff? They'll learn about the latest drug really fast, right? So let's look at some of these studies on seeds for a minute. But before I do, I want you to recognize that the later in life we intervene with a positive food intervention, the less effect it's going to have. The earlier in life we start the intervention, the more effect it's going to have. If you're going to, you know, if you're going to eat salt, then it's going to have a more damaging effect if you're eating salt your whole life. High salt your whole life has a more damaging effect. If you just had salt, high salt for a week or two in your life, obviously the longer years you do it, the more it takes its toll, right? The more the cancer is advanced, the less likely eating mushrooms or flax seeds are going to facilitate a reversal. The earlier the pathology, the more effect you're going to have on seeing the benefits. Did you follow that? Max, when would maximum benefit occur 
in utilizing flax seeds anti-cancer effects, specifically its anti-breast cancer effects, at what period of time would those effects on protecting against cancer be maximized? What's that? Before you develop the cancer. And the earlier in life, the better. Maybe even in childhood start doing it. But certainly the effects are going to be much more beneficial if you start this intervention before you have a diagnosis of cancer. Because once you have a diagnosis of cancer, it's relatively advanced. You know, what, for example, that um, if you had a breast cancer diagnosed on a mammogram, that um, coalesced cells, the amount of cells that have you know, been put together in a lump to coalesce large enough, to be replicated enough so you and I can see it, it has to be there at least 10 years. You've had cancer for more than 10 years. By that time, the majority of those cells have spread outside of their original site and gone to other areas. That's why mammograms are not early detection. They're late detection. That's why the effects or the benefits are minimal to not at all because it's usually too late. So once you know you have cancer, that's relatively late to be intervening with flax seeds. If there was a, like a, a retirement conference going on and I you know, pulled somebody off the street here, you know, elderly person, maybe a guy at the age of 70 and took out his prostate on the stage here, anesthetized him against his will and operated on him. I think I mentioned this earlier this week. Yeah, I did, I'm telling the same joke again. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so the point is, I took out his prostate, you'd find prostate cancer cells in almost all men over the age of 70, and the same thing if you'd look at women's breasts and chopped them up and blended them in the Vitamix and looked under an electron microscope and posted on the, on the screen here. You'd see cancer cells in almost all women's breasts over the age of 70, you know. So I can assure you, running around, so the point is, is that don't wait till the mammogram shows you have advanced cancer. Do something now while you, before you have cancer, or even if you have an early stage cancer, that's when it's reversible.